It's the early 2000s, and a 25-year-old Argentinian student is traveling around South America, enjoying the freedom of being a young person with savings. His money served him well, as the Argentinian currency is on par with the American dollar. He could travel and live like a king. The future seemed bright. But after a year, things started to get more expensive. He called home. But what he heard was... Hijo, la verdad que, que está la moneda muy mal. Ha habido mucha inflación. Se fue a la mierda el dólar. No está la situación para regresar. Our currency is dog shit. You can't buy anything. It's great that you left. A full-fledged monetary crisis is ransacking Argentina. Hoy por hoy hemos vivido una jornada bastante complicada para todos. Y al violento desalojo le siguió el cierre del banco. Y evita enfrentamientos lastimosos, como los que hubo hoy entre ahorristas y trabajadores. Está habiendo una especulación. Solo recuerdo, te puedo asegurar, que cuando viajaba antes del corralito afuera del país se me hacía muy This is Ezequiel Caibano, nicknamed Exe. An Argentinian immigrant now based in Ensenada, Mexico. He says that before the crisis that became known as Corralito, Little Corral in Spanish, everything was cheap when buying with Argentinian pesos. But he recalls being in Chile when he noticed he suddenly couldn't afford the cigarettes he would often buy. Heck, he could barely afford the air he was breathing. The money that gave him plenty was now worth a fraction of what it was before. Vos ibas a Brasil, por ejemplo, y eras un rey con, con muy poco dinero argentino. As the Argentinian peso lost value, it caused a panic and a bank run ensued. Pero ¿por qué la gente quería su plata? Porque hubo una estampida, porque hubo mucho temor. Todo el mundo quería sacar su plata de Argentina, llevársela fuera del país. That's when the government decided to acorralar to corral in Spanish, people into withdrawing only $250 per week. Desde hoy, rige el límite de 250 pesos por semana para el retiro de efectivo. Se evaluó al 100%. Wow. Lo del corralito fue que la gente que tenía ahorros en dólares en los bancos, el banco no le pudo responder en dólares. Folks who had their savings in dollars in the Argentinian banks couldn't get their dollars out. The banks could only return dollars in pesos, highly inflated, worth only a fraction of the value of the dollar. No tenían cómo devolvérselos. Entonces le dijeron, yo te devuelvo el dinero ahorrado en dólares, pero en pesos. O sea, si vos tenías mil dólares guardados, yo te voy a devolver mil pesos, que significaba la cuarta parte de lo que tenías. Una locura. Y el gobierno avaló esto. On January 6, 2002, the parity between the dollar and the Argentinian peso was officially annulled. The Argentinian peso collapsed. This sent the country into a downward spiral with massive nationwide layoffs. Social chaos was inevitable. Están siendo reprimidos de manera muy violenta. Ahora la policía también me golpearon a mí, a otra señora, ¿no? Y te pegan. The Corralito crisis ultimately caused hundreds of thousands of Argentinians to leave Argentina in the early 2000s. En mi caso en particular estaba justo había estado viajando fuera de Argentina y aproveché a hacer una especie de pausa en la educación. When the crisis reached its peak, Exe was in Chile visiting for a friend's wedding. He decided to prolong his sabbatical and stay in Chile. Vivo también en Chile viajando y conozco a mi mujer, pero estaba justo en una pausa de la universidad. Había hecho una pausa por un año para regresar y no regresé. He worked to earn Chilean pesos and eventually he met his wife and nunca regresé, nunca regresé. And didn't look back. He never went back. He realized nothing awaited him back home. So he continued his stay in Chile to continue working until an opportunity befell his newlywed Chilean wife, a job in a remote land on the other side of the continent. Today's episode is about how a young guy from rural Argentina ended up in Ensenada and how he makes a living promoting the gaucho lifestyle in Baja. It's all about asados, empanadas, and rural living. Don't go away. It's about to get country. From KPBS and PRX, this is Port of Entry. Where we tell cross-border stories that connect us. I'm Alan Lilienthal. And I'm Natalie Gonzalez. (laughs) 
If you're driving less these days, or you've got a car you don't need anymore, or repairing that old car is too expensive, consider donating it to support public radio. Your vehicle donation could be worth hundreds of dollars in support for KPBS. Thanks in advance. To get started, call 877-KPBS-CAR or go to kpbs.careasy.org. You're listening to KPBS Sport of Entry. Exit remembers what his friends and loved ones would say. Yo tengo muchos amigos más grandes que yo. Yo tenía 25 años cuando me fui en esa época de Argentina. Pero tengo amigos que, me llaman, que se fueron del país en esa época porque tenían más de 30 eh, o más de 40. Y tuvieron que irse del país pero forzados por la economía. No voy a Yo me fui porque... They had to leave. What do you do in those circumstances? Where do you even go? And how do you start over? But... Exe had kind of a silver bullet to avoid the fallout of the crisis in Argentina. He had a good excuse not to return to his country. His excuse? Bebe. Bien, ¿y vos? Sí. Javiera, his newlywed wife. Hola, soy Javiera. When they were traveling on their honeymoon in Chile, his new wife got a job offer as a teacher in a Montessori school. Y me llamaron, me dijeron, ¿te vendrías a México? Y llamaba telefónica, tapo el auricular y le digo a Exe, ¿nos vamos para México? One tiny detail, though. The job was in a remote town on the other side of Latin America. Ensenada, Baja California. La ciudad que estás viendo de fondo es la ciudad de Ensenada, Baja California, en el norte de México. The most important coastal town of Baja California is Ensenada, situated on Todos Santos Bay, approximately 60 miles south of the United States border. Sin duda, el puerto de Ensenada. 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 Bienvenidos Ensenada, Beer Ensenada, Mexico, in the early 2000s, was on the brink of a change that would transform it from a rural farming economy into a formidable tourist destination. Just east of the port city of Ensenada was a small but prospering wine country. The Guadalupe Valley, El Valle. Over the next two decades, the industry surrounding this attraction began to grow and eventually, boom. Food, hospitality, health, nightlife, outdoor sports, and real estate all began to grow exponentially. Many would build their livelihoods around it. As the Argentinian economy disintegrated, Exe found he had sort of a soft landing in this foreign land. When Exe arrived in Ensenada in 2002, he quickly picked up a position in sales for a local seafood exporter. He was able to put food on the table with ease and support his wife and soon a third member of the family. Ensenada was the land of plenty. A ver, esto de, del crecimiento popular o, mejor dicho, reconocido del vino en el valle que se puso de moda y trajo muchas inversiones porque no había interés, trae mucho turismo y hay mucha gente del interior del país, también de Estados Unidos, a, a pasar un fin de semana en el valle y ha creado esa necesidad de, de invertir, ¿no? Y... According to Exe, this boom opened up a lot of opportunities for new ventures and the ace up his sleeve, his gaucho upbringing. That's an Argentinian cowboy. For those who don't know. Entonces yo prácticamente viví toda mi infancia en el campo. O sea, en un pueblo chico, se llama San Carlos de Bolívar, que queda, es un pueblo más de la provincia de Buenos Aires. You see, Exe grew up in a rural town in Argentina called San Carlos de Bolívar, outside of Buenos Aires. It was a small town surrounded by fields and grasslands. Mis abuelos, como decía paterno y materno, eh, mis abuelos, son gente de campo de hace prácticamente un siglo. Es más, empezó en mis bisabuelos, gente que vino de Europa. His grandparents were country people from Europe, Italy and Spain. And they brought that lifestyle with them when they immigrated to Argentina in the 1910s, fleeing the First World War. Soy la, del sector de la gente argentina que se crió en el campo. San Carlos de Bolívar is part of the prairie grasslands west of the Paraná River. The flatlands make it an exceptional place for agriculture and raising all sorts of cattle, which is what Exe's family's livelihood was built around. Some of the best beef in the world comes from these grasslands. Todos los fines de semana y también los veranos, 
vacaciones de verano y invierno en los campos de mi abuelo o de mi abuela. Exa recalls tending the land, raising farm animals and working in the fields when he was in school. Aprendí a manejar en un tractor. Mm. Tenía 8 o 9 años con mi hermano. O sea, pues mi, mi papá me decía... He remembers the first motorized vehicle he learned to drive was a tractor. Wait, can you believe he was eight years old? When I was eight, I was playing Nintendo with my grandma. When I was eight, I was watching Hannah Montana on Disney <laughs> Channel. <laughs> I'm still watching it. Mi papá nos decía, ¿quieren manejar? Agarren el tractor, vayan a arar el campo, vayan a sembrar. Íbamos con mi hermano, era súper divertido. Así que... Nos pasábamos arriba de los caballos, con los animales, con el ganado, con toda la historia del campo, que era fantástica. ¿sí? He also learned how to ride horses and tend to them and other livestock. He would herd cattle on horseback into the grassland and back to their pen. He smiles as he remembers this. Que era fantástico. ¿sí? Creo que tuvimos una, una infancia súper linda, porque te imaginas un chico de entre 5 y 12 años en un campo con animales. Qué mejor. Para mí fue fantástico. It was fantastic. Exa says with a somewhat nostalgic tone. It was a beautiful upbringing in a tightly knit family. Always surrounded by siblings, cousins, uncles, aunts, and grandparents. Most of his immediate and extended family all based their life around the farm. And life in the field, raising cattle with a tightly knit family, meant that asados were an intricate part of the Caivano family. Cada vez que estábamos en el campo, la comida típica era un asado. Clásico, o sea, nada de comer, no, no, eh, se, se, se traía carne de la... De, bueno. An asado, a roast in Spanish, is an Argentinian barbecue. They usually involve big and thick cuts of meat that get cooked slowly over an open fire. In Mexico, we have carne asada, but it's way different. Warning to the vegans in the audience. Graphic description ahead. Sometimes the carcasses are skewered on a small metal cross and left over a pit to roast, or sometimes they get butchered into smaller pieces and placed on the grill. Delicious. Exa recalls sacrificing un animalito, referring to a 500-pound livestock, like pig, sheep, or goat in a carneada, a sort of butchery event, and either cooking the whole animal or big parts of it over an open fire pit with wood and coals. That's an Argentinian asado. Mm. Cada año, en los inviernos, que allá es junio, julio, eh, tanto la familia paterna como la materna hacíamos carneada de cerdos. Se mataban dos animales, dos cerdos grandes, para ser chacinados, embutidos, jamones. Es muy típico. Y nos reuníamos toda la familia. A couple of pigs would be sacrificed and a big family barbecue would ensue where all sorts of different preserves were made from the leftovers. Chorizos, cold cuts, ham, and other derivatives. Nothing was wasted. Real todo la, el conocimiento para, para hacer esto. Nos guiaban. Nos juntábamos cuatro o cinco familias durante una o dos semanas para procesar los animales. The older generation would take command while the young ones would play first or second mate in the operation. The gaucho lifestyle is living off the land, surrounded by farm animals, tending to the fields and making the most of what the land has to give you. Gauchos are basically Argentinian vaqueros. Living off the fat of the land. All right, take it easy, Lenny. Cowboys, yeah. We'll be back after a short break. Long ago, when the public square was the only place to share news, events, and happenings, people were drawn to it. Living in community with others was the route to understanding each other and the world around us. The public square has changed dramatically, but our need to learn and understand one another has it. This is Port of Entry. The Parker Edison Project. Listener-supported KPBS Cinema Junkie. Thank you for listening to KPBS Podcast and for being part of our region's virtual public square, where you learn not only about the headlines of the day, but about culture, music, and the issues that are important to all of us. Help keep the virtual square alive and well. Support podcasts like the one you're listening to right now. Just go to kpbs.org, click the blue Give Now button, and make a donation. And thanks again. 
You are listening to KPBS's Port of Entry. Exus hosted us at his home in El Sausal, a neighborhood about six miles north of Ensenada. The way to his house from the main road is through a canyon and marshes that make for beautiful scenery. Once on his property, we are greeted by his dogs, a healthy pack of six. His front yard is a courtyard at the bottom of a slope surrounded by little cabins where a large cement table sits under the shade of trees and a makeshift canopy. Along the slope, you see different fruit trees, lush with green from the recent rains, standing 10 feet tall, their flowers blooming. Exus house sits in the middle of the slope, overlooking the watershed of El Sausal, with a horizon where you can see the ocean. Makeshift steps trail down to the courtyard and off to the left of the canopy. Three big grills are parked next to each other, along with a brick oven in between them. He let the coals roar. He had us over for asado and mate. That's Argentinian tea. As we had our first sip, Exa spoke about settling in El Sausal 20 years ago. When Exa first moved here, this area was just a watershed, creek, river, and slopes. There was nothing this deep into the canyon. He recalls living in a house he rented at the opening of the canyons where cows would peek through his window. Roadrunners would rest on his porch. Random fauna sneaking into his kitchen. It was really rural. Turns out there are no services that reach this deep into the Sausal watershed. The only service that reaches from the city is electricity, and that took a while to get to them. But there is no sewage system and no city water system. No hay drenaje y no hay red de agua. Estamos en una zona rural. Punto. Entonces tuve que resolver la parte del drenaje, la parte de, de, del agua que tengo un pozo con agua que alimento de la casa con, con bombas y tengo un, un tinaco arriba, punto. So Exa collects water through a well and siphons it up the slope into his house with a couple of pumps that he activates twice a week. Then as he uses it, gravity pulls it all down. La casa está en la parte más alta del terreno, por eso tengo tengo terrazas. Entonces la parte de drenaje, si separé las aguas de uso en mi casa entre aguas negras, obviamente los excusados, aguas grises que se separen dos. Tengo dos formas, dos, dos áreas diferentes. Our producer Julio is a wannabe outdoorsman. Even though he rarely goes out. Sorry, he left us stranded waiting for him at a play last week. Hey, I wasn't feeling good and uh, traffic, all right? Yeah, yeah, whatever. Fulero. <laughs> he fell in love with excess of the grid living. Why don't you explain, Julio? Oh, don't mind if I do. I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, the homemade sewage treatment plan is what blew my mind. I mean, he has three tanks buried underneath the slope, all in consecutive order, and each of them receives the waste. The first bin has micro plants and nutrients and bacteria. That oh, food is ready. Let's talk about the food. No, nunca me dejan terminar. Yo creo que nace por la vocación de que de de azar que me gusta porque como te digo. In my case, lo viví de chico. The asado is a fundamental part of Ex's upbringing and identity. He refers to it like a vocación. That's vocation in Spanish. Mi casa invitaba y hacía yo los asados. Inclusive si íbamos a otra parte, a otro lugar, también me decían que era gallón. Me decían, ¿puedes hacer vos? Asociaban que era argentino y que me gustaba. In Ensenada, he would have people over for an asado on the weekends. Or his friends would invite him over to a carne asada to ultimately have him take over grill duty, given his barbecue prowess. Each time he would go, his friends tried to talk him into starting his own food business. Se fue dando de manera paulatina. No es que hubo la intención de crear una empresa de comida argentina. Si no, fue al revés. Yo tenía mi negocio, que la verdad que estaba conforme, me iba bien económicamente, me daba rentabilidad. He already had a stable source of income with his job as a salesman. At first, he didn't really see a need for it, but after a lot of pushing from friends, he went for it. He joined forces with an Argentinian compatriot that had fled Argentina during the same crisis 
and together they opened a restaurant and catering business. Durante un año cubrimos eventos en varios lugares de acá del de Ensenada y del Valle más que nada. Y al año siguiente, eso fue en el 2012. Al año siguiente, en 2013, nos invitan a participar en un en un colectivo. They had a couple of food trucks in different gastro collectives. Then they opened a private restaurant in Ensenada and then another one in Valle. Y además tenemos ese restaurante. Nos fue muy bien. Abrimos otro más al año siguiente en Ensenada, ya una, un privado, un restaurante privado fuera de un colectivo. Y tuvo tuvo su momento de auge y su momento de caída. But eventually, after about four years, the restaurant and his partnership ended. It boomed for a while, but then had to shut down. That's kind of the way it is in the Valle. Even with a tourist boom, things open and shut down all the time. Y continué, y ahí, ahí nace Dios mi empresa. En 2016-17 nace mi empresa de, de eventos. Exe Alta Parrilla, Exe's catering business, was born from those experiences in 2017. He continues serving at all sorts of events, from private weddings to big festivals, like this recent beer festival in Ensenada, where he usually sets up two stands and outsells other establishments. I think I actually tried one of those choripanes at the beer festival one year when Tulengo played. It was delicious. Prefiero dar servicio privados y públicos, pero como eventos. Eh, acá, o sea, más que nada me llaman para matrimonios, aniversarios, cumpleaños, bautizos. Y los... He prefers the freedom that catering provides, not to be rooted in a single location. Our producer Julio joined him for day two of the festival. Exe managed two stands at different spots where he sold 1,200 choripanes, minus the two which our producer ate. Qué gordo. Exa said that choripan was the best friend of the beer, and I had to prove it, all right? Did he prove it? God damn it. <laughs> yes. Exa says that success comes down to choosing the right spot to set up your food stand. ¿Te diste cuenta que la ubicación, como dicen en Estados Unidos, location, location, location? And he was right. His stand was right in the middle of a busy intersection at the venue, and right after our producer stuffed his face, the customers started piling up. Hey, it was delicious, okay? Get off my back. Y alguien que vino a asesorarnos nos dijo esta frase de que el primero en un local es primero, segundo y tercero es ubicación, ubicación, ubicación. When Exe is not catering, he leads workshops and grilling classes for those interested in the gaucho style of grilling. He soon hopes to launch workshops in a more permanent site in Ensenada. As the grill in Exe's courtyard fired up, he brought a number of different entrees to prepare on a cutting board. We saw chorizos, empanadas, and a couple cuts of meat. He placed the cuts and the chorizos on the grill and shoved the empanadas into the oven. We helped set the table with the cutlery and the condiments. One of which was our favorite. El chimichurri. Es perejil seco, o perejil fresco, ajo y aceite. Y lo demás va jugando. Se puede poner o vinagre o limón. Y después a cada uno le va sumando, restando. Muchos lo... According to Exe, the base of any chimichurri must include at least parsley, garlic, and a neutral oil. Some add vinegar or lime juice. Others add dried crushed chili. Some cook the chimichurri. Others leave it fresh. You have to dice everything finely, mix it together, and season to taste. It's a fresh, acid, herbal contrast to a greasy cut of meat or sausage. The chorizos looked grilled to perfection. It was time for the bread and to stuff our faces. Choripan is a combination of the words chorizo, meaning Argentinian sausage, and pan, bread. Choripan. So, a hot dog? Yes, a fancy Argentinian hot dog, pretty chorizo, much. El clásico chorizo es, es un chorizo de carne mixta, que tiene carne de cerdo, carne de vacuno. The chorizo they use follows a 40-40-20 ratio. 40% beef, 40% pork, and 20% fat. His recipe includes some Argentinian spices. La Argentina se caracteriza por tener ciertos condimentos. Muéstrenselo. ¿Les pareció? Se distingue a... 
al español y al... Sí, total. Muy difícil. Así que esto hacíamos justamente cuando era chico, hacíamos chorizo. Out of the Brick Oven came out the empanadas. Vamos. Acá en la primera empanadita. ¿Quién quiere empanadas? Quiere, acá hay de carne y jamón y queso. Empanadas are a staple in Argentinian cuisine. They make them out of different fillings depending on the region. Es la comida más típica junto con el choripán. La empanada es muy característica de Argentina. De la región. De Argentina muchísimo. The typicals are minced meat with veggies, ham and cheese, among others. We each had a couple of empanadas. Julio had nine. Yes, he had nine. Yes, he had stop. Sorry, dragón. Ay, ¿no te quedaste con hambre, chiquito? <laughs> X's family used to own and operate a small empanada factory in La Plata, where he would help his family prepare and sell them. Y con mi, mi hermano le ayudamos a empezar la, esa empresita. Entonces estábamos ahí en la, en la mano de obra. Eh, hacíamos todo. La masa, los rellenos y toda la parte de repartición y locales y demás. And on to the main course, the meat. We let the meat rest five minutes, and then Exe proceeded to slice and sprinkle some salt over them. And it was delicious! Argentinian salt bay. Ooh, yes. Exe shared the simple intricacies of cooking meat over live fire. Sí. O sea, mucha gente en Argentina cocina muy bien la carne. Y me tocó hacer esos casos que tuve mi abuela materna, mi abuelo, mi padre, también tíos, son muy buenos en la Asados only require three ingredients. Your cut of choice, hopefully a good one, salt, and the open fire. Everything else is just either unnecessary or a condiment, like the chimichurri. They aren't essential. Una cualidad del asado es la preocupación de cómo cocinas. O sea, porque el asado en sí, ¿qué lleva? Un buen corte de carne, sal y fuego. Nada más. No hace falta más nada. Yeah, our Mexican carne asadas are still about the meat, but it's more about what goes around the meat and into the taco. The salsa, the guacamole, the pico de gallo, the beans, the cheese. But Argentinian asados are just about a big, thick cut of steak to be eaten by itself. Maybe with some chimichurri and a little bit of salad on the side. Not necessary. Cuidado con los perros que son bravos, eh? Ya vi. ¿Con la comida? Sí. Ajá. Tengo cuatro sí. perros, sé perfectamente cómo. Sí, y la peor de todas, ¿saben cuál es? La más grande, la café, la monca. Esa es... La viejita. Esa es la peor de todas. Excess dogs run around a nearby field. There's a couple of cats and free-range chickens there as well. The dogs are commanded by la café. The matriarch. Who Exit claims snatches food from unsuspecting and unattentive guests. Cuidado con, mm -hmm. con eso, ¿eh? You know, I've actually made some chimichurri before. I like adding cilantro. Who? Me. Asked. <laughs> Was that a grade school joke? So, yes, did you like it? So immature. Oh my God. Let's move on, shall we? To what? The meat, mijo. Ahora le damos. <laughs> After our asado feast and with the mate still flowing, We asked Exe what he misses most about Argentina, and he had a sort of a confession. He's visited home numerous times, but never really longed to move back. But something happened. He visited Argentina during the height of the last World Cup. And something changed in him. It was the first time in 20 years that he was drawn back to his home country. Siempre que viajaba a Argentina en los últimos 20 años, eh, no me sentía identificado con el lugar. Iba de vacaciones y ya a los 10, 15 días quería regresarme a, aquí a Ensenada. Pero esta vez, en este último año, en el 22, cuando fui a ver a la familia y algunos partidos de Argentina allá, Realmente me sentí muy cómodo. You see, soccer or football is a big deal in Argentina. And Argentina was crowned champions on this last tournament in Qatar. Exa is still starstruck about the feat and the feeling he felt about going home during this time. The stakes were high this cup. Have y'all heard of a guy called Lionel Messi? Oh, the Messi del 
puta ama de Messi, señores. Y a Messi, Messi mazal, Messi mazal, Leo mazal, Leo tra, Leo mazal, Leo well, it was his last chance to nab the championship for his home country after two consecutive failures. Gonzalo Montiel can win the World Cup for Argentina with this kick. As Lionel Messi and Argentina yes! have won the World Cup. Argentina, you can cry. You can cry tears of joy for Lionel Messi. He is finally, finally a World Cup winner. And he did. The prophecy fulfilled. Argentina nabbed their third star. People filled the streets for an incredibly joyful celebration that made Exe want to stay in Argentina, to actually stay and live, a feeling he hasn't had in over 20 years since he's lived in Ensenada. I imagined and planted the possibility to live in Argentina. La verdad que no sé si será por la edad, por los años, pero me sentí mucho más cómodo con, con el entorno, con mi país. Fue un cambio para mí. But unfortunately, Argentina's glory is still overshadowed by the country's economic woes. All he hears is... Ahora estamos peor que con de la Rúa. When he calls home, he senses the same feeling of uncertainty that he did 20 years back. Uy, ¿por qué estamos peor? ¿Qué pasó? O sea, que la inflación, qué miedo. Había más estorbas, estaba, viste, había otra gente. Ahora son todos, me parece que son todos malandros, no quedó nada. No quedó nada, ya no quedó nada. No está para volver a Argentina. ¿Para qué? ¿A qué y para qué? As we speak, Argentina is dealing with hyperinflation of 100%. Hunting for bargains, shoppers in Argentina carefully compare prices as the cost of living almost doubled last year. Maybe before you used to buy clothes and food, now you prioritize food more and buy a few less clothes. Inflation hit a staggering 94.8% in 2022. Pero bueno, cuento corto, cuento corto no está para volver. Obvio, obvio. O sea, no, no me recomiendas que regrese a Argentina. De ninguna manera, de ninguna manera. Qué lástima, qué lástima. Their currency is at 200 Argentinian pesos to one American dollar. Not much has changed for folks. Many Argentinians are still moving out, trying to find a better life somewhere else. Como que yo me hubiera salvado, porque no me fui expulsado del país por la crisis, me fui por una, por una aventura buscando conocer más y justo coincidió que el país se vino abajo. Hubo un momento crítico que fue el 2000, 2001, 2002, que fue un fue caudizón, se fue mucha gente de Argentina. Abandono de gente joven de Argentina al trabajo porque... Exe believes that Argentina is still not a country for young people. Hay algo que, que me impresiona que aprendí con los años que el mexicano es muy hospitalario. O sea, te abre las puertas de tu casa sin saber quién es, quién sos. Yo creo que estamos acá viviendo hace más de 20 años, casi más de 20 años, por lo mismo, ¿no? Por sentirnos como en casa. Exe says he is filled with gratitude for the country that took him in. He thanks this great land that gave him plenty. In the 20 years he's been here, he's only received welcomes and open doors. Mexican folks don't care where you're from. They welcome you either way. At least those in Ensenada do. He says, Ensenada is mi casa. This episode of Port of Entry was written and produced by Julio Cesar Ortiz Franco. Luca Vega is technical producer and sound designer. Adrián Villalobos is media production specialist. Alisa Barba is our editor. Lisa Morissette is Director of Audio Programming and Operations. And John Decker is Senior Director of Content Development. This program is made possible in part by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, a private corporation funded by the American people. This project was also made possible with support from California Humanities, a nonprofit partner of the National Endowment for the Humanities. Visit callhome.org. Soy Ana Lilienta. Y yo soy Natalie González. Nos, Nos vemos pronto. pronto.